John C. Lilly, a medical practitioner and neuropsychiatrist, developed the flotation tank in 1954. During his training in psychoanalysis at the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health, Lilly commenced experiments with sensory deprivation. In neurophysiology, there had been an open question as to what keeps the brain going and the origin of its energy sources. One hypothesis was that the energy sources are biological and internal and do not depend upon the outside environment. It was argued that if all stimuli are cut off to the brain, then it would go to sleep. Lilly decided to test this hypothesis, and to do this, he created an environment which totally isolated an individual from external stimulation. From here, he studied the origin of consciousness and its relation to the brain. I, I, I'd read a lot about um, John Lilly's experiences and seen movies like Altered States, and you know, didn't really know what to expect getting into the tank the first time. And uh, uh, on doing that, though, I, I, I really got the sense of the uh, weightlessness. It was the most remarkable feature to me at first. Is just how you know you're suddenly without any sense of gravity. Um, I was pretty skeptical, to be honest with you, um, and. Um, had a pretty, uh, uh, you know, mixed, mixed result in the sense that uh, the context was very beautiful and nice, and I felt good, and I got in the tank, and almost immediately, uh, a drop of uh, a super saturated uh, water got in my eye with the Epsom salts, and you know, I hadn't, I didn't really think about that, and so it started to burn. But I stayed in for 50 minutes and um, basically did a little bit of meditating. Which I was doing it already, and got out, and I thought, well, gosh, you know, that seems like it was kind of a waste of time. Blasted off all the Epsom salts in the incredibly luxurious shower that they had there, um, and thought, you know, thought about it, but I thought positively enough about it that I thought, you know, when I get back to State College, I want to talk to like a tanning salon or something like that and see if they want to put in a um, tank. But I didn't really realize what an interesting experience it was until the next day when uh, I'm a lap swimmer and I went to go swimming the next day. And um, at that point in my swimming, it was really always the first 20, 25 laps I would have to do in order to really get loose. And I got in the pool there in Berkeley at the YMCA and the very first lap, I remember pushing off from the wall and the very first lap it was just like silk. And I realized right at that moment that I had, not, that I had been thinking about the tank as a mental thing when in fact it's a body-mind thing. You know, that there's variation in how we uh, perceive the world. There's uh, color vision genes that are variable. So not everybody sees colors the same way. There's uh, uh, genetic variation in taste receptor genes. So some people taste the chemical and it's very bitter. Other people don't taste that chemical at all. So these sorts of variabilities and um, you know, perhaps uh, one aspect of temperament or personality is the um, variation in how we see our minds. And uh, sensory deprivation tank, isolation tank, is, a, is seemed to me to be a perfect uh, situation in which to study that. You could suddenly remove the effects of any environmental stimuli, including social stimuli, how people are interacting with each other, suddenly have that person in a place where there aren't these effects, then you might be able to study how they, how they see their mind in a, in a, a clearer way. Uh, the study of consciousness and alteration of consciousness, because in order to study it basically it means we need to sort of change it and study the way in which it changes. And so the tank was like a dream in the sense that it was a legal, safe, reliable, comfortable way of altering people's consciousness in a way that was uh, uh, doable in 21st century uh, university, at least for a while. Um, you know, I should say that so too is, you know, poetry such a thing. Uh, one of the most interesting things that came out of it, though, was um, some work we were doing in having people write up their experiences. And I did a little bit of work in some classes because one of the things I do is teach writing where uh, I was having people use the tank as an occasion for writing because they would say, oh, I don't have anything to write about. And I would say, well, I'll give you something really that you don't have anything to write about. You can experience nothing for about an hour, and I want you to write about that. 
And you know, of course, it was up to them if they wanted. That was just a choice that they had. Um, but it was an incredible writing tool, actually, because I saw people uh, write in ways that they were not, they didn't know that they were capable of, because they really wanted to try to describe the experience. And the experience was sort of resisted being put into words, which is sort of good for a writing instructor, because it makes you then polish your language and seek that best word, if not perfect word. So it links up both on the sort of research end and the pedagogical end. So people would, would float for an hour and then um, answer a, a, a survey questionnaire. Some of the questions were open-ended um, about you know, uh, what they saw in the tank, what they heard. Some people have um, uh, you know, um, visions and, and will hear sounds and some, a lot of people will hear their heartbeat, for example, and um, you know, maybe uh, focus on their breathing because when there's no other sounds, those are sounds that that you know emerge. They're probably always there, but we're not paying attention to them because there's so much else going on. Um, but you, you know, we did uh, question them with specific surveys about about their mood to see how things might have changed during that time in the tank for them. I have a book coming out in June about uh, the importance of uh, first-person perspective in science is something that we're not really comfortable with. What do we do with first-person perspective? Um, and I incorporated some of my flotation experiences into that uh, uh, book. But um, I was also involved in the uh, design of the study that we were doing, which was to correlate um, extreme experiences people had in the tank, right? So we were using scales uh, that we drew from uh, different parts of the psychological literature um, to help filter out people who had either very, in, uh, very positive experiences or very negative experiences, intense experiences in some way, and seeking to correlate the intensity of their experience with some uh, attribute of their genotype. So we took uh, DNA. So I was involved in uh, um, the experimental design and also in designing the framework whereby people were going to write up their experiences, because that was part of how we determined whether or not somebody had an extreme experience or not. So, um, anthropology is the study of uh, humanness, basically, and, and uh, I mean that's um, really sort of the definition of the word. And uh, practically, that means we're studying, you know, both the biological cultural, the linguistic, the historical aspects of what it is to be human. And um, anthropology has always been a very synthetic field, drawing on different disciplines, expertise that people have, you know, specialized knowledge in different areas, bringing those together to make maybe a more holistic, better, unified understanding of what it is to be human. Because it's not any one of these aspects individually. You know? the language you speak and what that implies about different different experiences you might have during your life, you know, is a, an important aspect, uh, as is the, the biology, you know, what you may have in terms of genetic variation yourself, you know, are you male or female? Right there, that, that determines a lot about your experience, in, in especially in certain, certain societies. But, you know, we want to sort of look at, um, at the human experience from multiple perspectives simultaneously. You know, I think um, looking at how people see their minds and looking at how they they interact with um, with with the environment, and especially you know, in terms of the the large questions um, that we face during during life, really are important anthropological questions. And, and you know, there's a lot that anthropology can offer this investigation. Um, you know, there there's some uh, uh, major breaks in in um, science. You know, divisions between different kinds of science. Uh, today and there probably always have been and you know but uh, trying to come through some of these walls and break them down so that new syntheses can be made I think is a really valuable approach to doing to doing science and that's where some major breakthroughs can be made so our effort in this in this respect was to try to you know try to unite the um, um, uh, self-reporting of the internal experience especially under specific conditions like the tank where we could probe directly 
you know, what somebody was experiencing when you were sure they weren't experiencing anything from outside. Because, you know, all the sound, the light, gravity, temperature changes, all those are being removed. The, the social environment are no longer there. The person is left with, you know, definitely he's left with what he brought into the tank, you know, what kind of um, programming. Um, they use one of John Lilly's words. He, he, you know, has both hardware, you know, the evolutionary programming that our biology instills in us, as well as the early programming from life experiences and training and society and language all these things, you know, we can, we can um, at least isolate the immediate experiences that person has to try to um, explore what effects he might have on, you know, being in this, this new environment. A flotation tank is a tool that allows people to float in an isolated, weightless environment. Subjects float in a saltwater solution that is the same temperature as the surface of their skin. Flotation tanks are easy to use. Just climb in, stretch out, and relax. Floating in the tank is a very powerful tool for becoming more aware of the internal self because it stops all input from the external world. Those who use the tank are able to experience a more fluid self. When speaking about the flotation tank experience, Craig S. Enright, MD, said, There you are, suspended in embryonic silence 100 miles out in deep space. During the first few minutes upon entering the tank, you will be monitoring different body sensations, but as the water calms down, the body assumes a position of balance in the weightless environment.